Good afternoon. Wow, I nearly said good morning for the people who doesn't come from somewhere else. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the session. We've got quite a packed time and we're going to be quite strict about the times. There is an eject button if you uh, go over your time, so be very careful. We've only been given the titles and the names of the authors, so please forgive us if we don't uh, say your first name because we don't know it. And if it's not the first author that's presenting again, please forgive us for any errors that we make. Um, over to you, Adi. Great, and you're Francesca. Uh, and I'm Francesca Conradi from South Africa. <laughs> and my name's I.D. Rusin from the Union. Um, and I do know the name of our first speaker. So um, Peter Sigalski is uh, giving our first presentation on timing of acquired resistance to fluoroquinolones uh, during treatment of MDR-TB. So. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, the Preserving Effective TB Treatment Study was um, a large multinational prospective cohort study of MDR-TB focusing on acquired resistance. And in this presentation, we're going to look at the timing of acquired resistance to the second-line injectable drugs and the fluoroquinolones. So that was our objective, was to determine how quickly acquired resistance develops to these two classes of drugs during treatment of multidrug-resistant TB. So as I said, it was a prospective cohort study in nine countries. We enrolled consecutive consenting adults with locally confirmed pulmonary MDR-TB at the start of their treatment for MDR-TB from 2005 to 2008, and we followed them prospectively with monthly sputum cultures um, until the end of treatment um, or until the end of 2010, which is when field work stopped. The, a duplicate of all the positive cultures were shipped to CDC for further testing. So initially, the first and the last isolate from each patient were tested for susceptibility to 12 drugs using the proportion method. And if the drug susceptibility test results changed for INH, rifampin, the second-line injectables, or the fluoroquinolones, then both isolates were genotyped using the 24 locus miro VNTR method. So among patients with changing DST results and matching genotypes, we went back and did susceptibility testing on all of the sequential monthly specimens between the first one and the last one to determine um, when, when acquired resistance emerged. And we defined time to acquired resistance as simply the date of the sputum collection for the first isolate displaying resistance minus the date of um, starting treatment. So here's the study population. We had 1,659 subjects who had a baseline isolate within 30 days of starting treatment and who were treated for at least 30 days, in other words, enough time to get to the next isolate. Um, a number of patients, 29% um, did not have a positive, did not have any positive follow-up cultures, meaning they, most of them culture converted quickly or in some cases died or defaulted early during the co course of treatment. Of those, 91% had their cultures shipped to CDC, and we were able to recover both baseline and follow-up isolates with DST results for 832 individuals. So here's the flow diagram. Of those 832 individuals, 250 had differences between the first and last isolate for susceptibility to one of those four drugs, INH RIF, the quin well, not four drugs, but INH RIF, the quinolones, or the second line injectables. And 165 of those, or 66%, had matching MIRU um, VNTR results, or in a few cases, results that differed by only one locus. So among those patients in whom the DST, DST results changed, there were 78 with serial isolates showing a clear-cut change from susceptible to resistant. So either they had a, a series of susceptible isolates and then a series of resistant isolates showing that um, there was a clear-cut change. And 57 acquired fluoroquinolone resistance in a median of 91 days with an interquartile range of 56 to 198. 29 acquired second-line injectable resistance in a median of 116 to 136 days, differing a little bit for the different injectable drugs. And eight of them acquired fluoroquinolone and second-line injectable resistance. Um, these are histograms showing the distribution of time to acquired resistance in, um, in months. 
And you can see that the um, large majority of acquired resistance occurred early during the course of treatment, but st still there was a substantial group of patients whose acquired resistance did not develop until late in the course of treatment. And um, on the, your right are the, is canamycin. I'm only showing canamycin for the, in the interest of time. And on your left is the, are the results for um, ofloxacin. Numerically, these break down like this. So the number of patients with acquired resistance to the quinolones, 57. The median, is there a pointer? Well, you can see the column labeled median. And for the quinolones, thank you very much. And for the quinolones, it was about three months was the median, but a quarter of the patients acquired resistance to the quinolones in less than two months and um, a quarter of the patients acquired resistance to the quinolones um, after almost um, seven, six, six to seven months of treatment. They were still acquiring resistance. For the second line injectable drugs, the median was about two to, um, the, the median was about four months time to acquired resistance, but a quarter of the patients acquired resistance in less than three months, and a quarter of the patients acquired resistance in more than eight months. So in conclusion, I think this is the first quantitation of how rapidly acquired resistance develops to fluoroquinolones and second-line injectables um, during the course of MDR-TB treatment with those drugs. As I've said, it was a median of three for fluoroquinolones, four months for the second-line injectables. One-fourth of the fluoroquinolone resistance, uh, acquired fluoroquinolone resistance, was detectable in seven to eight weeks and 17 to 19 weeks for the second-line injectables but one-fourth emerged after six months, um, and 10% were detected after 15 months. So there still is some acquired resistance developing even late in the course of treatment. Um, there was a number of factors that were associated with um, uh, social, clinical, and programmatic characteristics um, in terms of time to acquired resistance, but it was overwhelmingly dominated by the number of other drugs um, to which the isolate was resistant at at, at the beginning with more resistance at the baseline, accelerating the time to acquired resistance. And it was also very strongly associated inversely with the number of effective drugs in the treatment regimen. So more effective drugs, um, much slower frequency, much not only frequency, but rate of um, acquired resistance. There's a lot, of patient, a lot of people to thank because this was a big study, 26 sites in 10 countries, and um, so I would like to acknowledge all of them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Um, so we have time for questions. Actually, we have about 20 minutes slotted for each presentation. Um, if you have a question, please come up and just introduce yourself and then ask Peter a question. Uh, hello, my name is Alex Pym from, from Durban. Hey, Alex. Uh, very nice study, Peter. I was wondering if you looked um, for the early, the emergence of early resistance, um, whether you'd looked in the sputum samples in other ways to detect uh, heteroresistance to see if you could detect low levels of pre-existing uh, fluoroquinolones genetically, um, um, which wouldn't have necessarily showed up in the, the, the phenotypic in testing. In the phenotypic testing. Yeah. Um, I don't have those data for, these, for this particular analysis, but we did have cases in which there, we did have a, a, a small fraction of patients in which there was more than one strain present. Um, Peter, so effective treatment decelerates the, the acquisition. Yes. Um, were there enough numbers to look at like a speci the specific fluoroquinolone or the dose of fluoroquinolone? And Let's see, I have some extra slides and it might be in there. Not working. Not going to let you. Um, so th these are Kaplan Meyer curves showing the probability of remaining without resistance to ofloxacin, um, without acquired resistance to um, ofloxacin depending on baseline resistance to the second-line injectables and um, effective treatment with the second-line injectables so that you can see that 
Um, and I picked these because the second line injectables had by far the strongest effect. So the more effective drugs, um, the less not only frequency of required, acquired resistance, but also delayed acquired resistance, and the effect was strongest for the second line injectables. In other words, the second line injectables are uh, apparently important not only for the treatment of patients, but very important for protecting the fluoroquinolones from acquired resistance. Right. So I guess I was just wondering the fluoroquinolone itself, because we struggled with using a higher dose in theory to prevent acquisition of fluoroquinolone Right, so we, we, te we, um, we only tested Cipro and Oflox at the time because the standardized methods for um, moxifloxacin were not yet established at the time. Um, but the question of which specific quinolones and which specific injectables is, um, is, is still on the slate for further analysis. Okay. Oh, one more question. Yeah, same thing for um, number of second-line drugs and number of effective drugs. And um, number of second-line drugs with resistance, you can see is there's um, uh, fewer effective drugs. Acquired resistance emerges faster. And um, as there's um, more drug resistance at baseline, um, acquired resistance emerges faster. My name is Amber Kunkel. I'm from Harvard. I was just wondering how these... Um, results that you've shown correlate or um, affect the time to coulter conversion? Um, good question. Um, acquired resistance was associated with delayed culture conversion, um, but I don't have those figures. I don't have numerically. Um, I, I, can't, um, I can't tell you exactly what the difference was. And if I may ask one question, what measure of adherence did you use in terms of knowing whether the patients were actually taking their medication? Um, most of the patients were treated with directly observed, un uh, treated under DOT. We, um, we recorded all of the treatment that the patient was given. Um, however, we, um, we overlooked brief interruptions, interruptions of less than one week. We didn't count. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next study that we're going to be looking at is a comparable 12-month incidence of renal insufficiency in MDR-TB patients treated with standard canamycin-based regimens or concomitant, or concomitantly with tenofovir, and the study was conducted in Namibia. I'm not sure who's the presenter is just arrived. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Ruswa. I'm the second name there. Um, and good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. So I'm going to talk about what happened in Namibia. Um, and this is based on the data we had from 2014. So um, Namibia is a small country in southern Africa, but with a high per capita burden of TB, with an incidence um, rate of 561 per 100,000. Um, we also have um, a high HIV prevalence amongst the general population, and amongst the TB patients, it's almost half of the TB patients have HIV. Um, in 2014, we had uh, 157 cases of confirmed MDR-TB cases um, started on treatment, and of these, 47% um, had um, HIV, and we, we treated most of these patients with a canamycin-based regimen, and we also know that, uh, or rather in Namibia, in our ART guidelines, we treat our HIV-positive patients with a tenofovir-based regimen. So this is tenofovir disoproxil, so unlike the TAF, so we use TDF. Um, we also know that canamycin has a problem with uh, uh, with nephrotoxicity, particularly on the proximal tubules. Same with tenofovir also tends to have uh, pro uh, problems with nephrotoxicity. Um, and in this, this is of course part of a bigger study, but here we're trying to compare the renal function in patients with MDR-TB with canamycin um, and uh, having uh, tenofovir co-administered. So we what we had noticed when the guidelines changed to a turn off of a preferred first-line regimen was the concern that most of our patients are on canamycin, 
but it's an amino glycoside. You try to give them tenofovir, there might be a problem. So um, we did not have a lot of literature on this particular aspect. There had been a couple of case reports, and we know the manufacturers did not recommend co-administration. So um, we, we now did um, a retrospective um, uh, analysis of the records, uh, looking at patients between January and December 2014, um, and also looking at the laboratory records. And uh, uh, our main source of information here was the electronic records for, for the um, MDR-TB. Um, we also measured the estimated uh, glomerular filtration rates using the uh, chronic kidney disease um, epidemiology collaboration equation, and we compared the, that estimate using uh, the ANOVA by the treatment group. So we had uh, three groups here. We had the group where we had given the canamycin, uh, this is HIV negative, just the canamycin, and then the group where we had given the canamycin with a turnoff of a base regimen, and the other is the group that had canamycin and any other ART regimen. And we use, okay, I'll show you the Kaplan-Meier graphs and uh, the Cox proportional hazard. Okay, so this is the flow chart. Um, so I think there might be, a, um, so, okay, so we had the 157 patients, but the one that we included here is 135. Um, 868 uh, were um, having, were HIV negative with only the canamycin without the tenofovir. 44 had the tenofovir and 23 had um, any other ART regimen that was not based on tenofovir. So looking at the three groups again, um, the, the, the mean age is similar, um, and of course maybe slightly more, uh, uh, slightly less males in the canamycin TDF group. Uh, but of note here is that uh, most of our patients were followed up uh, for about four to five months, and um, they, the ones who are HIV positive generally had more tests, so these are uh, mainly the, the uh, the creatinine and, and all those other biochemical tests than the HIV negative ones. And then the baseline creatinine or clearance or estimated GFR was this uh, for the different groups. And um, the ones on TDF generally had um, less time on ART than uh, the ones on the other regimens. And then um, following up these patients, um, naturally we, as we were measuring the drop in the um, estimated GFR, um, of course you might not see a lot of differences here, but if you look at the preceding slide, um, the baseline GFR was actually quite similar across all the three groups. Right, and then now looking at the differences uh, before and after um, the period of assessment, we noticed that, um, of course, this was mainly a chance finding because we didn't exactly expect it. We noticed that, um, first of all, um, there was no main difference between the three groups in terms of the baseline uh, uh, GFR as well as the the, 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 the GFR at the end of the assessment. Uh, but what we did not is also that for all the three groups giving, of course, we had given them canamycin and we had defined um, renal insufficiency as a GFR of less than 60 milli, uh, mils per minute per 1.73 uh, square area, um, so surface area. So we we noticed that for all the groups, there was a statistically significant drop in the GFR. Of course, the mean GFR did not fall below what we had defined as the um, renal insufficiency uh, threshold. But if you look at this uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier graph, you see what, what I was calling a chance finding. So um, the ones that were not on um, Tenofovir were the ones actually who experienced the bigger drop in the in the in the estimated GFR. Um, the ones that had uh, tenofovir and canamycin, 
there was a drop, but if you look at the uh, hazards ratio, it was not statistically significant, uh, the difference between this group and this group. Right, um, so in conclusion, we did note that there was a decline in renal function amongst all the groups of patients, and however, the, the, the decline was similar amongst patients with canamycin-based regimen and the uh, canamycin-based regimen HIV negative and those HIV positive with the TDF-based regimen. Uh, we, because we were mainly concerned about what guidelines to give, because there's not a lot, there was not a lot of guidance at that time about what to do with patients who are on tenofovir and canamycin at the same time. We, from this, we could say that um, canamycin and tenofovir co-administration probably we shouldn't be as worried as we were at the beginning. And um, I think we also maybe might know the experience from when tenofovir was introduced. We're very worried about its um, um, renal uh, nephrotoxicity profile, but I think most of the studies have largely lessened our fears because it's not as, uh, the prevalence of nephrotoxicity is not as bad as we initially feared. Um, and of course, if you notice the group that I was talking about, the group which experienced the biggest drop, it's actually a small group, it's 23. So uh, there's a lot that can be said statistically. So we would like, of course, to look at a bigger study uh, to see what's wrong with that group of people. But one thing that comes to mind is um, they were not on tenofovir for a reason. Because majority of patients that are put on tenofovir are patients who are generally well with no other complications. And when they do develop complications, that's when you put them on the other regimens that are not tenofovir based. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Anybody got any questions on this one? Because I know I do. Uh, I'm uh, Inge Koppelaar, I'm working in South Africa, um, treating lots of patients like this. Um, I'm interested in the CD4 counts of the patients, if there was any difference, and if maybe the group that was not on tenofovir was maybe on second line ARVs. And I'm also interested if you looked at the electrolytes, because we noticed that a lot of HIV positive patients, sometimes the clearance stays all right, but they go to terrible yes. hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia. Yes. So I'm, oh, did you look at that as well? Yes. Right, I can answer that. Um, so I'll answer your second question first. So we did look at the electrolytes, um, and I think we, we have this information somewhere, just not here. We did notice that amongst the HIV positive, there is a higher chance of electrolyte imbalance, mainly hypokalemia, as you say. But of course, our, uh, uh, our limitation was we, on, we only measure limited number of electrolytes in our routine profile. I think it's the same that you do in South Africa, but mainly hypokalemia was a bigger problem with most of these patients, HIV positive, more than the HIV negative. Um, now, in terms of looking at CD4 counts, I do not have that data ready here. Um, it was generally not part of the assessment, but I think that's data we can always retrieve and look at. Yes. Yeah, my question was going to be, was there not a potential effect modifier of the CD4 count? Yes. But the, the issue around using tenofovir is tenofovir is part of a fixed dose combination. Yes. So we're already giving a patient a handful of medicines and then to have to change their medicines to something that's given twice a day. It becomes a, a programmatic problem that you don't want them to be able to pick out various medicines. So it's, it's, this is quite reassuring data. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? No? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, our next um, presentation, we only have uh, last names. You'll have to introduce yourself. Um, it's a dose ranging activity of clofazamine in combination with the first line regimen in the mouse model of tuberculosis treatment. Okay, hi, Thank I'm you. Nicole Ammerman. Um, So clofazamine has been associated with treatment shortening activity in second line regimens for MDRTB in both in patients and in the mouse model. And um, 
It has also been associated with treatment shortening activity when combined with a first line regimen for TB in the mouse model. But one of the key questions about the use of clofazamine in TB treatment is what is the appropriate dose that should be used? Um, in humans, 100 milligrams per day is the usual dose um, administered to patients with MDR-TB, and apparently this dose works. Um, in mice, 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram per day has been used as the equivalent dose. And one of the um, <coughs> questions that we wanted to address was, can we use lower doses of clofazamine and achieve the same treatment shortening effect that we've seen? So to address this question, we use um, the mouse model, and uh, we conducted an experiment in which, um, and this is a, a scheme of the experiment, but I'm not going to enter into any details. Um, the, the basic message is that we compared um, the activity of the standard regimen to the activity of the standard regimen plus clofazamine where we range the dose of clofazamine. Um, so um, then I'm just jumping right to the results. So during the um, first two months of treatment, um, I'll actually I'll say it to uh, read this graph first, we infect the mice and we, we implanted about four and a half log 10 CFU in the lungs. Then we um, wait for two weeks, so the bacterial load increased to about 7 log 10 CFU in the lungs, and then we start treatment. And we treated with either the standard regimen, which is in blue, or, um, or the standard regimen plus clofazamine, and we ranged the dose from 1.5 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. So what we can see here during the first two months is there was a clear dose-dependent additive effect of <coughs> clofazamine. Where things get a little more interesting is in the continuation phase. So the um, first thing I'll point out is that when we added clofazamine at 25 or 12.5, so half of what we had considered kind of the standard dose, uh, the results were the same and the mice were culture negative by three months of treatment. Um, but what was really surprising to us was that at the lower doses of clofazamine, after the first two months of treatment, the clofazamine seems to be antagonizing um, the activity of the rifampin and the isoniazid. And I'll get back to this antagonism in a minute. Um, but one of the, the key issues that we were, when we do experiments like this, that we really want to address is when the mice become culture negative, are they really cured? So we want to look at relapse. So this table summarizes, um, shows the proportion of mice with culture positive lungs um, six months after stopping treatment for uh, durations of two months, three months, four months, et cetera. Um, so again, a key finding here is that in the mice that received the standard regimen plus clofazamine at 25, or 12.5, there was no difference in relapse. And another interesting finding was if we took the dose as low as 6.25 milligrams per kilogram, after four months of treatment, all of the mice in this group were cured as well. So even uh, at this lower dose, despite some apparent antagonism that we saw in the, the, the CFU counts, um, it didn't seem to affect the sterilizing activity of the regimen. If I Go back now to this um, slide to, as I said, we were, the antagonism we saw by adding the lower doses of pyrazinamide to the standard <coughs> regimen after the first two months was really surprising to us. We weren't expecting that at all. And we had no idea what was going on. But the most obvious thing that was happening was after the first two months, you, we discontinued administration of pyrazinamide and ethambutol. So we thought maybe if we we hypothesized that leaving those two drugs in the regimen might prevent this antagonism with the lower doses of clofazamine. So we then conducted a second experiment where, again, this is basically the same as the first one, except <clears throat> for both the standard regimen and the clofazamine-containing regimens, we then, um, after the first two months of treatment, uh, half the mice continued to receive pyrazinamide and ethambutol, and the other half of the mice did not continue to receive pyrazinamide and ethambutol. 
So again, during the intensive phase, and in this experiment, we only looked at clofazamine doses ranging from 12.5 to 3.1. Um, but again, here during the initial phase of treatment, we can see that there was this dose-dependent additive effect of clofazamine. But of course, what we were really interested in was the continuation phase. And to our total surprise and in complete contrast to our hypothesis, um, the non-removal of pyrazinamide and ethambutol did not prevent the antagonism we observed between the low doses of clofazamine and rifampin and isoniazid. Um, however, we don't have the relapse data yet from these mice. We're still waiting for it. So we don't know if there is any effect in the sterilizing activity of the regimen when we continued administration of pyrazinamide. So <clears throat> our conclusion up to now is that in combination with the first-line regimen, clofazamine at 12.5 milligrams per kilogram was as potent as clofazamine at 25 milligrams per kilogram in the mouse model. Um, and at low doses, Clofazamine antagonized rifampin and isoniazid after the first two months of administration. You know, why? Um, we have no idea why. <laughs> Our data indicate that the antagonism is not due to stopping administration of pyrazinamide and ethambutol. And um, perhaps the clofa clofazamine is stimulating the efflux pumps, and this is decreasing the antimicrobial activity of the low-dose clofazamine, and perhaps also rifampin. Um, but we have a lot of work to do to try to um, address this issue, but that's where we are right now. Um, so that's it. And I just want to thank um, Jacques Grisset and Eric Nuremberger and everyone at Johns Hopkins. and. Our, our funder is the ACTG. Thank you. Thank you. We'll open the floor for questions. Hi, Sarah Ald from Emory. Um, how are you assessing the CFUs and sort of bacterial presence in the mice? We um, sacrifice the mice and remove the lungs and homogenize the lungs, plate them. Okay, because it, it looked like they actually had the same number all throughout, but you were sacrificing them each month to assess? Not, well, I mean, not the same mouse, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, we have, we have five mice per group per time point that we sacrifice for CFU right, Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Oh, sorry. Good. Good question. Um, it's Gustavo Velasquez from, uh, from Harvard. Just a uh, uh, quick question. So are you planning experiments with efflux pump inhibitors? And um, if that hypothesis doesn't work, what else would you look at? Um, that is not what we're looking at um, right now. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, we know that clofazamine induces efflux pump activity and that, um, yeah. Um, so that's not really what we are focusing on right now. Um, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> um, we are, um, to be perfectly honest, we're looking for collaborators to address this issue. Um, we very much focus on the experimental chemotherapy studies, and we continue to move forward to look at treatment shortening regimens. Um, and we're very interested in how clofazamine is working, but we are also very interested in how clofazamine is working, how it's affecting the membrane. We thought um, definitely there was some interaction with pyrazinamide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really answering your question, but <laughs> it's, 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 it's a really, we, it's something that we um, discuss a lot. <laughs> 
great. Yeah. Um, so that's another really great question. Um, so previously we had always worked with clofazamine at 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram um, under the estimation that that was equivalent to 100 milligrams per day in people. And that was based on, there's not very much PK data with clofazamine in people, like very, very little. Um, and that was based on some studies in leprosy patients that had been done in the 70s. Um, now, newer data, including data that was presented at this meeting last year um, by Novartis, indicates that in mice, perhaps the dose of 10 milligrams per kilogram might be more equivalent to the 100 milligrams per day in people, which would be approximately the 12.5 dose that we were using in the mice. In light of the shortened regimen we're implementing for TB, how does varying the INH dose affect the antagonism? Is any work on that? We haven't. Uh, <laughs> We, um, I will say that we have done, so I don't really know, especially not in mice, uh, we haven't done that work. We have done some in vitro work where we've looked, at, where we also see antagonism with clofazamine when combined with rifampin and isoniazid at different, and we've done a couple of different concentr low concentrations of isoniazid, and we see that we see the antagonism, but more than that, we haven't done. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, the next person's name I actually do know, <laughs> Rupa, if you could come up and do your presentation on the rollout of new drugs to treat drug resi resistant TB and the challenges with implementation. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My presentation is different from the ones that you listened to just now. It's more operational and implementation science. And what I'm going to show you is that political will, commitment, new drugs, and systems in place will actually enable us to uh, reach the targets of the NTB strategy. So I'm going to share with you successes and challenges with implementation of the uh, new drugs to treat drug-resistant tuberculosis in South Africa. Um, South Africa is rolling out decentralized and deinstitutionalized management of drug-resistant TB. Uh, the map in front of you shows you the 17 decentralized sites that we have in KZN, which is a large province. And these uh, red dots actually manage your MDR TB patients. And the centralized drug-resistant TB unit, which is KDHC, is where I work and where Bedaquilin uh, story started. Okay, so the South Africa's treatment plan currently is with your standardized MDR uh, TB treatment and then your individualized XDR and pre-XDR treatment. However, we're still seeing low cure rates and completion rates, and the rollout of the new drugs is intended to change that. During implementation, we considered the latest TB guidelines, and the guiding document for the rollout was this uh, policy document that was uh, published by the National Department of Health in June 2015. When translating the policy into practice, we had training by the National Department of Health, cascading of this information. We looked at lessons learned from the Bidaquilin Access Program for the implementation plan, developed SOPs and training, and then piloting of the tools. Uh, if you look at the targets for the Bedaquilin Clinical Access Program, we had 72 patients that were recruited in KZN, and our target for the national program was 1,000 patients in a year, which was very ambitious targets, and I'm going to show you how system strengthening uh, and doing it in a very systematic way was uh, successful. Uh, so the lessons learned from BCAP, uh, during the rollout for the 75 patients, we found that sometimes there was sharing of medicine in wards. So the patient in one bed will say, that patient wants it and I have to have the bedaquilin. And even before they were properly worked up, they would start. Uh, there was missing doses related to the nurse administration in terms of the three times a week uh, dosing. Uh, sometimes patients who were outpatients were also confused with the dosing regimen. There was difficulties in monitoring adherence and duration of therapy. 
uh, the, the um, additional monitoring that was needed with the uh, bedaquiline and the switches was also something that we needed to take extra note of as we rolled out to 1,000 patients. So we looked at critical success factors that was needed to ensure positive outcomes. And one of the first things we said that is that the right patient must be selected. At that point in time, we had very high patient numbers at King Dini Zulu with no decentralized sites in Itaquini, which is a very large province managing a lot of patients. So we up upgraded our decentralization efforts and we created more uh, decentralized sites to move out your patients with stable MDR treatment. We had training, case presentations, mentorships, and we developed a pre-printed application form, which was reviewed by the clinical committee. And uh, as per the guidelines, these patients would be triaged to be fast-tracked, uh, those for provincial approval and those for national approval. Uh, the tracking system was needed to ensure that applications are not lost in the system because if you can imagine a thousand patients and patient selection is optimal, so we didn't want anyone falling through the gaps. So the pre-printed application form consisted of a consecutive tracking number. So every application that came through, and it could come through from any of the sites, had a consecutive number. They'd, we then uh, developed the application form such that there's a tick box for the reason for starting bedaculin. We weren't sure at that time how many would be uh, due to uh, autotoxicity or nephrotoxicity or what the other reasons would be. So uh, this form helped us to collect information that was needed by national to uh, manage the program. We included HIV details uh, into the application form, especially since at our site we didn't have a fully integrated HIV and TB uh, program, and it was important for us to consider the ART switches that were needed with the bedaquiline rollout. Um, so the tracking number as at uh, 15th of October, we were up to 1,085. So those were the number of applications that came through. A unique BL number, at that time we thought all our patients will go on to bedaquiline and linezolid, so we developed, put in a BL number. This was given after approval. So irrespective of whether the patient went to pr uh, province or national or was fast tracked, they got a consecutive BL number. Uh, all facilities in KZN could work patients up for the bedaquiline dust, uh, creating capacity, and approval was at our site initially. So in this way, we were able to uh, build capacity in doctors, and we will soon be uh, making this available to other sites in KZN. The next critical success factor was that all patients must be monitored very closely. Uh, again, all patients were uh, inpatients, there was reduced bed capacity, so we upscaled our training, uh, the treatment initiation was at our site, and then they were admitted to sites close to their home, thereby improving capacity of, uh, of the doctors. What we did is we developed a bedaquiline scheduler, so Dr. Masters, the clinical head, was instrumental in this. There you have your bedaquiline start date, which you just plan in and it'll actually tell you when the completion date will be and the schedule of uh, uh, monitoring that should, be ta should take place. In a facility where you have large numbers of patients, it's difficult to actually monitor compliance, so this is what we thought would help. There's also a linezolid start date and using the 12-month uh, duration, you were able to do that. Okay, so the the next critical success fact is the time lag between diagnosis and treatment initiation, which we said must be less than five days. Because of the labor-intensive um, uh, process that we were implementing, we found that it was longer than five days. There was incomplete application forms, and we had training and retraining of prescribers. Uh, it resulted in a lot of system-strengthening uh, efforts to ensure that results are received timelessly and looked at timelessly. Uh, there was fast-tracking of applications and patient education, and this is still a work in progress. In terms of medicine supply management, we found that there was a difficulty in forecasting and quantification as there was no previous usage history. Uh, there was high cost implications and funding was something that we needed to consider, as well as other medicine that would be used in the treatment regimen. So it was not only the bedaquiline. We had to look at the linezolid, the ARTs, the levofloxacins, and then the medicine packaging where it came in a pack of 188 tablets, which was a six-month supply, also need to be considered. Our solution to this was using assumptions. So we used a lot of assumptions in terms of the expected new patients, uh, defaulters, number of deaths that we would expect, medicine stops due to adverse events, and weight changes. We uh, managed our stock 
with closed stock, open stock, and working stock using tally cards. And for every single patient that was initiated, we kept aside a six-month uh, supply of medication for them. But to manage the expiry dates, we actually moved stock from our open stock into our working stock, which we pre-packed into patient-ready packs. Ideally, we need an electronic system to do that, and we will be rolling that out soon, and that's work in progress. In terms of prescribing and administration, we found that uh, it was difficult to track the dosing regimen was actually problematic, and we needed to know when patients are extend, uh, when we're applying for uh, extended treatment exactly what happened. And what we developed was a pre-printed prescription chart where every chart had a BL number. So the BL number was actually the trigger for the doctor to prescribe this. And when pharmacy is dispensing, they look and see whether that BL number is there so that we know the right patient is being prescribed by Daquilin and has been worked out properly. The prescription is pre-printed, so you have a day one to day 14 with the 400 milligrams daily for 14 days, and then there's an administration record on, on this. In terms of our systems in South Africa, uh, the blue medicine administration chart, which, which is uh, used as a, for inpatients, it has been replaced with this, so it actually allows us to monitor prescribing and dispensing uh, in a better way. You had the 14 days here, and then you had another 14 days, and then we had the outpatient prescriptions. So the outpatient prescription as well is pre-printed, three times a week dosing. It uh, forces people to uh, to learn the new dosing regimens, and we integrated your TB and your ARV drugs so you can now manage the patient as one. Uh, adherence as well is another critical success factor. Uh, there were challenges with patients, uh, high loss to follow up, not only with bedaculin, but with the other uh, patients as well. We're looking at pill boxes and uh, structured counseling for patients, uh, a pharmacy scheduler, which will send an SMS and reminder, and that's work in progress, and it should be coming out soon. In terms of monitoring adverse effects, we, we all know the challenges with that. We looked at targeted reporting for uh, patients on bedaculin. Uh, we will be implementing causality uh, meetings. There is a framework that has been developed. It has been a little more challenging to implement that, but it's work in progress. We developed a, a, an inpatient tool where it lists the, the body systems and then whether the ADR is observed, listed, date of onset, suspected drug rating, and action taken. It was intended for a multidisciplinary approach to pharmacovigilance where the nurse completes the ARD, uh, ADR observed, the doctor will then complete the rest, and the pharmacist will complete the reporting tool. There's a lot of work that we need to do on that. Reporting and recording is also critical uh, in order for us to monitor outcomes. We've got dedicated staff with the help of partners that have come in which are managing our reporting and recording, and uh, we have data monthly meetings. So just by looking at systems and addressing all aspects of this, we were able to increase our applications from zero in July uh, to 1,085 on the 15th of October, applications that have come through, 986 have been approved, 800 have started, some of the delays in starting is because of the ARV switches, uh, sometimes you may get a patient who refuses treatment even after approval and then we've got to counsel them, uh, there are 61 patients that have died and we're actually looking at causality assessments for those patients. So despite human resource constraints, high patient numbers, and time constraints, KDHC will be able to meet the target of 1,000 patients initiated on Bedaquilin by the end of 2016. So what we thought was impossible and difficult to do, very ambitious, we were able to achieve, looking at a multidisciplinary approach, um, using uh, tools that can monitor where our patients are at any point in time. And uh, we have seen improvements in treatment success rates. However, that's still being assessed, and it's, uh, we will be reporting on that. So the way forward is cascading of training and, and best practices, improved MNE, strengthening pharmacovigilance, and upscaling access of bedaquilin. Uh, all this is done with recognition of the risk of increasing resistance if not done correctly. And I think this talks to even the short cost rollout, which has to be done in a very systematic way with system strengthening uh, being taken into consideration at every point. So watch this space for more information because we do have, a, I think, one of the largest cohort of patients on bedaquilin at our site. Uh, and together with the multidisciplinary team, we are able to uh, move forward. Acknowledgement to the team that we are working with, United Way, World Way and the MDR-TB Partnership Program, who is uh, funding us to, to improve and enhance drug-resistant TB patient care. Um, 
And I think together we can rise to the challenge of whether it's bedaquil and the new drugs, the shortened regimen, or uh, ending TB by 2035. So as a facility, district, province, and country, we have made great strides, and we do need to continue to build on our achievements. A special thanks to all the healthcare workers we continue to fight against TB and HIV, often at great risk to themselves. As a team, we can do it. Thank you very much. All I can say is from the mouth to the mammoth. <laughs> That's a, it's a huge roll up and you've done really well. Thank you very much. So confessions of a chair. Um, we mistimed things a little bit and, and uh, I realized that each talk you were instructed just to, to keep it to less than 10 minutes with, uh, with questions. So we've used up our discussion time after each uh, presentation, which is fine, uh, but I just think for the remainder, we will just have one question after each presentation and try to stick to the number. And I know you're all saying, how difficult can it be to be a chair? You just sit up there and you introduce people, but clearly we've, uh, we've fumbled. Um, is there a question about the Bedaquilin rollout? I think it was interesting presentation and, and uh, I think we will uh, welcome. I, I, and if people don't have, I, I have a question for you. J just, you know, you've given the patients, the number of patients who've died, but just an understanding of how many patients you might have lost to follow up um, who've started treatment that you don't know what's happened to them. Okay, so we do have a pharmacy register that we monitor in adherence rates. Um, I must admit that is a challenge because we, we're in a temporary position and at the moment, um, we, we don't have exact figures on the loss to follow up. It's work that we hope to complete in the next month. Um, so, I don't know, Dr. Mark, did you know what you do? Working for, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Great. So, I think it's up to me, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so our next uh, presentation is on treatment outcomes uh, from Rwanda. And uh, welcome our presenter up to introduce himself. And and if you can keep to the eight minutes, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to do that. So uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present the data on the treatment, treatment outcome of uh, patients which are under treatment of uh, tuberculosis, MDR tuberculosis, but measured by uh, sputum uh, culture conversion. So, so just a background of the uh, progress that we have made in terms of uh, programmatic management of MDR-TB. We started that in 2005 uh, with the implementation of the solid culture. And at that time, uh, that was done uh, also by the next step that we also established the first line DST using the proportion method in 2006. But at the same time, also uh, three years after, we also implemented the uh, LPA uh, looking at the screening of uh, resistant to rifampicin and isoniazid. And, uh, one year after we started the DST for the second line on solid culture, and also in 2012 we implemented the liquid culture, and finally with the advancement of expert, expert MGRTB, we implemented in 2012. Uh, currently we have about 44 machines which are available and also uh, throughout the country, especially in the district uh, facilities. In terms of the uh, treatment of managers from TB, MGRTB, we have four specialized uh, centers which is able to initiate these standardized DRTB treatment regimes. And until now, we have been able to really enroll to, uh, to 750 patients on treatment. So in terms of some of the experience of our treatment initiations, we have made a very big achievement in terms of uh, enrolling all people in treatment before they die. So only two patients now um, uh, were died uh, before they can start the treatment, uh, uh, MDRT treatment. Uh, this is mostly very important in terms of effective uh, uh, treatment of management of uh, DRTB patients. So in terms of our last uh, result of the survey on DRTB, we have, we have, very, uh, we have registered 1.3% of TB, the DR in new patients, so new sputum semia positive, and 8.7% of uh, the treatment case with uh, resistance to uh, trifampicin and azonazid. But until now, we have not yet uh, registered the case of XDRTB in our population. Uh, in terms of uh, the data that I'm going to present here, this was a retrospective review of 326 patients which have, which have started on MDRTB treatment from January 2010 
to June 2014. And from those uh, patients, we were able to have a treatment outcome record for 317. And after that, unfortunately, we were able only to get 100, uh, 183 uh, patients with culture uh, done during the baseline before the treatment initiation. Our outcome was to see the proportion of patients who circumvent at two months and six months, and also uh, to look at also the outcome of those patients. In terms of the outcome of this patient, we really are very glad to present that we have about 90% uh, of treatment success, in, which is which accounted for uh, cured patient cases and also completed uh, treatment. So it's very good for a program, program. And we are still having 9% uh, of patients who died for many reasons before uh, the complete of treatment. In terms of uh, some of the demographic, demographic uh, patient characteristics which have been able to really have a negative impact on the outcome, only HIV uh, uh, seemed to have to, to impact on the, the outcome of the patients. Others were, have minor problems, but we have also most of our patients with MDRTB were male, and also uh, we not, didn't see any case of uh, resistance to the second line uh, treatment. In terms of the sputum conversions, uh, we achieved, uh, so 90%, 92% of uh, our patients achieve a sputum conversion, uh, and also uh, said 7.6 patients did not be able to really uh, achieve these uh, sputum conversions. And uh, among of those uh, patients who circumvented, about 83% culture circumvented within the first two months. So it's a very big achievement in terms of uh, circumventions of a patient. So, but unfortunately, we were able to, to resist as 18 patients who died following the treatment for many reasons. So among them, 18, 10 were HIV infected, and also uh, comorb comorbidity were among also the things that impact the, 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 the or influence people to die on treatment. And among uh, 14 patients who did not convert in our population, it's why died during the follow-up, three defaulted with, uh, before the complete treatment, and among them, 10 remain persistently culture positive despite the clinically improved patients. And we were, not, we were not able to really know about uh, their, uh, their culture status after this uh, treatment uh, end. So in conclusions, we can say that Rwanda is really able to resist a very good treatment outcome among our MDRTB patients. We've uh, been uh, uh, experienced by a high proportion of patients achieving culture conversions at two months, and also with high treatment success at 89% uh, of uh, cases. And we have also seen that in our population, still now, until now, HIV disease uh, can significantly increase the risk of death among our patients. But however, we have some challenges that we would like to note also because we were not able to re really have all patients uh, getting all the result for the, for the culture, especially after they move from uh, the hospitalization to the ambulatory phases. And also, we are not able to really look at, at our patients after the treatment to see if there is anything about the long-term cure rate about uh, the patient. And to that also to finish this presentation by suggesting further studies about evaluating predictors and also uh, predictors for the culture conversions, which will be need very helpful in terms of uh, better care of individual patients, in terms of really uh, designing a very aggressive uh, uh, treatment for individual crisis. So with that, I would like to acknowledge the support of the government of Rwanda, the University of Rwanda where I come from, and also the ITM, the State of Tropical Medicine, for the supporting of this, uh, my attenders, and, and also all the co-authors who have uh, contributed to this uh, piece of work. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll take one question. Um, if someone has a question. Yes, Andy. So I, th I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, one of the biggest challenges in our cohort is that we could not really have all the patients providing the culture. Uh, so we're not able to get the culture result for all the patients. But 
and even those who did not convert the culture, we didn't have the final culture results at the end of the day, so we could not know exactly what was the, the cause of the death, but actually all of them were really clinically improving during the follow-up. As I say, uh, we could not really get the really cause of that, but I, I assume that those HIV patients will have other comorbidities, which is one of the reasons maybe. But we, have don't, we don't have any precision in those data. I think what remains uh, very impressive about this is your high treatment completion and cure rate, which is one of the highest I've seen in a long time. So this is, uh, yeah, this is a very good thing because uh, for, for, for our cases, because we, we have a very effective management at the initial phase, so we have a, an hospitalization uh, scenario for our patients, and also after they move the hospitalization, we have also some community workers who, will, again, continue to follow them. And also we didn't resist as any case of, of, of uh, fluoroquinol resistance in those, those patients. So that's maybe some of the reasons which explain the high rate of success in our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. And now uh, changing continents altogether, we're going to predictors of unfavorable treatment outcom outcomes in adults uh, presented by <laughs> Dina. Yeah, I'm Dina Nair. But Dina Nair from India. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, the title of my study is Predictors of Unfavorable Treatment Outcome in Patients with Multidrug-Resistant Tuberculosis in India. So a little bit of background. The efforts to control tuberculosis is, thank you, okay. is being hampered by emergence of drug resistance. We know that 3.9% of new cases and 21% of previously treated cases are having MDR-TB. And 5,80,000 new cases with 2,50,000 deaths occur annually. So the treatment for MDR-TB is long, ranging from 18 to 24 months with second-line drugs, which are less efficacious and costly. And they're also associated with high adverse events. Uh, the 2013 cohort, the proportion of MDR-TB patients with treatment success was 52%. Uh, with death 17%, failure 9%, and loss to follow up of 15%. Whereas at, in study conditions, the successful outcomes are high. A systematic review of 36 studies have shown that the six, there is 62% successful outcomes with 11% deaths and 13% loss to follow up. And individualized treatment regimens have a much higher success rate, around 64%. So in India, India is one of the highest high burden countries uh, with 71,000 estimated MDR-TB cases out of 3 lakh notified TB cases. Cumulative outcomes have been reported in 31,365 patients with 47% successfully treated, uh, with 22% died and 20% lost to follow up. Though there are reports on uh, treatment outcome, there's insufficient knowledge on factors associated with unfavorable treatment outcomes. So a better understanding of the risk factors is needed to design effective interventions, which might help to reduce morbidity and mortality and thereby improving treatment success. So our objectives were to describe the demographic and clinical characteristics, the program defined treatment outcomes, and factors associated with unfavorable treatment outcomes among patients with MDRTB who were enrolled in three selected states in India during, during the period 2009 to 2011. So it was, a, it's a, it was a retrospective cohort study, a reviewing of records. Uh, the study population included all patients enrolled for treatment from 1st of January 2009 to 31st of December 2011. So we selected three states, uh, namely Kerala, Delhi, and West Bengal. We selected these states because the MDR-TB Diagnostic and Treatment Services was initiated in 2008, much earlier than other states. So this is actually the programmatic manage, a schematic flow of the programmatic manage of MDR-TB in India, where the presumptive MDR-TB patients are diagnosed at the peripheral health centers. The sputum samples are collected. 
and the samples are sent to the Intermediate Reference Laboratory for Culture DST. Prior to 2012, we were using L conventional culture medium. And after 2012, India has moved on to rapid diagnostics. And once uh, it's diagnosed, uh, once the results are ready, it's communicated to the district TB officer. And if it's a case of MDR-TB, the patients are traced and counseled and referred to DOTS Plus site for treatment. At the DOTS, Dots Plus uh, site, they're hospitalized for about a week for initiation of treatment. And then they are referred to their respective district TB controls or DOT centers for treatment. Treatment is given for 24 months and they are followed up and assessed for the standardized treatment outcomes. So we did the, uh, we collected the data from the existing treatment cards and registers at the DOTS Plus site. We included patients who had resistance to INH and rifampicin, who were monoresistant to rifampicin, and those who had documented treatment outcomes. And treatment outcomes were divide, uh, as classified as favorable and unfavorable. And favorable, we included cured and treatment completed. Unfavorable, we included failed, those who failed to treatment who died, lost to follow-up, treatment stopped due to adverse drug reactions, those who were switched on to XDR-TB, and those who were transferred out. And we calculated the treatment delays as the time interval between the receipt of sample to initiation of treatment. So these are the results. 836 patients were initiated on MDR-TB treatment across the three states. A majority were males. And uh, majority were in the age group of 15 to 44. Uh, around 55% of the patients had failed on previous treatment. 60% of the patients had a low body mass index of less than 18.5. Majority had a sputum culture grading of more than 2. And uh, what we found was about 20% of the patients had MDR-TB. That is, they were resistant to INH and rifampicin. And monoresistance to RIF was found only in less than 5%. And 42% of the patients had uh, resistance to S, uh, streptomycin and ethambutol in addition to rifampicin and INH. So the time to treatment initiation, uh, this, the time the, there was a considerable delay in uh, the uh, treatment initiation from sputum collection to the uh, MDR-TB treatment collection. So that's, that was around 128 days. And the treatment outcomes, we had a favorable treatment outcome of 60% and an unfavorable outcome of uh, 40%, which was distributed, uh, it was similar across the states. And we had 17% uh, death and 16% loss to follow up. So the main characteristics we found that were associated with unfavorable treatment outcomes were mainly, uh, it was gender, that is males had more uh, uh, unfavorable outcome, then older age, a low BMI, and HIV positivity. So a quarter of our, those, these patients had adverse drug reactions, and uh, the gastrointestinal and psychiatric disturbances were more. So the important findings what we found in this study was uh, it was done in three st uh, states in India, and it points to a large burden of MDR-TB in India in patients who failed to previous TB treatment or those who had a recurrence. And uh, the delay between the sputum collection to start of MDR-TB treatment is considerably long. Uh, we had a treatment success of 60%, which is above the global average. Unfavorable treatment outcomes were largely due to death and loss to follow up. So male gender, older age, being underweight, and HIV co-infection were significantly associated with unfavorable treatment outcomes. Uh, so a little bit of uh, about these predictors, maybe these are the predictors. The factors which we found in our study are similar to the factors which were found in other places. So uh, like male gender, they had high risk of unfavorable outcomes. Maybe due to, the, though the reasons are unclear, it could be due to higher rates of smoking and alcohol consumption, which itself can cause our risk factors. And also the males are less vigilant and compliant with the treatment. Older age group, that is age above 40 years, was also a risk factor. Maybe it could be ex attributed to the associated comorbidities like diabetes mellitus, hypertension, and cardiovascular diseases. And we know that diabetes itself has an increased risk of failure and death. 
So the low BMI, that's less than 18.5, was also a risk factor for mortality. It's actually a manifestation of severe disease, and it impairs host immunity against mycobacteria. Uh, and HIV infection was, is also associated with malnutrition. And observational studies have shown timely antiretroviral treatment may, might improve survival. But uh, in our uh, cohort, uh, we had uh, the HIV, we had a few numbers, but all the HIV patients, all the positive patients had worse treatment outcomes. And they, we, do, we do not have any record of the antiretroviral uh, retroviral treatment in them. Increased frequency of adverse drug reactions also can cause poor adherence and interruptions in treatment therapy, which can cause high loss to follow-ups. Sorry. Oh, it went off. Is it? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh, I pressed the other button, I think. So the strengths of the study was it was conducted within the routine programmatic setting with a large sample size, and we adhered to the stroke guidelines. The limitations was, uh, of course, due to the retrospective nature of the study and variables we, with missing data. So it has got important two programmatic implications. Uh, the long delays between sputum collection and culture DST results are unacceptable. So the answer is rapid molecular test. Uh, for rapid diagnosis and early initiation of treatment. And RNTCP in India has already moved on to the rapid uh, diagnostics. And the poor treatment outcomes, that is high death and loss to follow-up, should improve. Uh, the risk factors which we identified in this study are non-modifiable. So we feel a shorter and easier to take MDR-TB treatment regimen will, will be a solution. And we know that observational studies have shown a nine-month regimen is effective and well tolerated. And RNTCP in India has also, uh, also considered its adoption and rollout. And it's also tempting to think that nutritional support in MDR-TB patients might improve the treatment outcomes. Uh, though there's no evidence for such an intervention, uh, there's a scope to assess this in clinical trials and programmatic implementations. So I would like to acknowledge and thank the Central TB Division of India the state TB cell of Kerala, Delhi, and West Bengal, and staff of RNTCP units who extended their full support for conduct of this study. And this research study was developed, this research protocol was developed as a part of the sorted course. So I would like to thank the sorted course faculties, the Union Southeast Asia, Union uh, Paris, and also MSF Luxembourg, and also the conference organizers for providing us this opportunity to present this study. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. I, I think we're going to move on to the next uh, presenter, um, former colleague, Christoph, uh, who's going to come speak on drug-resistant TB treatment costs, trends towards more affordability under threat with new drugs. Christoph. Okay, thanks, Heidi. Well, yeah, we, you heard about um, the challenge of gathering adequate medical evidences, uh, about setting up operational models that are um, improving DRTB care, and now we are doing about talking about something which is, can be painful, which is money, and uh, how the DRTB treatment cost trends towards more affordability are unfortunately under threat with the new drugs. And here, actually, we are facing a dilemma. Is um, Of course, in public health, we'd like to treat uh, with an e in an efficient way as many patients as possible. So for that, we need the most affordable treatments. And in the same time, we need also to get a market where the companies can develop new drugs and and the market being in, being providing incentives big enough, actually, for the company to invest and uh, and to sell their drugs. So. Just um, um, well, this slide I will move. I will just skip it because you've all all heard about these figures and how difficult actually it has been so far for so many patients to access the new TB drugs. And just to take um, a step behind, actually um, on the um, the RTB market, it's been very difficult for a long time to get a, an, a precise idea about what was the cost of every single DRTB medicines and actually provided by different manufacturers. And that actually led um, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, together with partners, and the union has been a, a partner for many years for that actually activity. And recently, Unitied within the um, NTB um, project has been actually supporting this 
last edition of DRTB Drugs under the microscope. Actually, the whole idea was really to put on one single paper for every single key DRTB medicines to put just a comparison of uh, actually what different manufacturers would provide as a price, and this was put as a benchmark just nearby the GDF price, which, which is, as you know, a pool um, mechanism for procurement and negotiating big volumes with companies. So they are quite um, an interesting be benchmark, actually, to, to take. And the whole idea was to bring this data not only to purchasers, but uh, also national TB programs, NGOs, and also the civil society so that patients could also go to their government and ask for why sometimes they were paying such a high price for some medicines. And, um, and also, we always tried in an introduction there to explain a few challenges around um, why we face some monopolies for some drugs the quality, and also issues around quality, um, around quality. So the last version is there. Actually, I have even a few USB keys where this document are, and there are actually samples over there behind. There are also USB keys for those willing to avoid actually overweight to going back home. And in this USB key, actually, it will be a fixed dose advocacy combination because you'll get not only the last DRTB drug under the microscope, but also out of step, actually, the last one, with actually how much countries may be lacking actually still to be implementing the right policies for adequate DRTB care. And all these actually reports, of course, are available on msfaccess.org website. The methodology, actually a standard questionnaire uh, is sent to companies listed on the Global Fund um, list for tuberculosis procurement and, uh, and there these companies are, have managed actually to get their drugs either WHO pre-qualified, either registered by the stringent regulatory authority or qualified by the expert review panel which is a joint initiative between Global Fund, GDF and its WHO pre-qualification team which is providing the expertise behind. The data in the last version that's available at the, uh, at the front of the room had actually were, were collected, it was published in March 2016 and based on data collected in August, September 2015. And there is an update together in that document based on the last figures and, uh, and, um, and prices obtained by GDF in their consultation of manufacturers in May. So it's fully updated through this way. Interestingly, and actually, Probably some in this room may remember that in 2001, a DRTB treatment was costing $15,000 per patient. And, uh, well, we came a long way, even if it has been a painful travel. And recently, just uh, when you look at here, you've got figures in blue 2011, in, in red 2015, and in green 2016. So the decrease is quite significant and uh, allowing us to be today for the lowest price at $1,600 for a, a two-year treatment. And using these figures, actually, for the short-term regimen, we are today using the TDF prices between $600 and $800 treatment. Actually, when you look at the um, publication, which is mentioned at the bottom of the slide, just looking at API and finished product costs and let's say what could be um, out of factory costs, these treatments with a reasonable markup for the company could still go down to $100 and $400 to, to, $100, uh, to $400 per treatment. So there could be a margin there, especially for the drug that have been on the market for a longer time. How actually we managed to get these decrease in costs? Um, of course, what is the good news actually out all of that is even within the small market that is the RTB and in past years it was even smaller due to the little number of patients actually that were under treatment. Even there it can work as a market whenever competition can start to appear um, across manufacturers. So earlier on Capromycin, linezolid, levoxifloxacin, and cycloserine already experienced some decrease. And actually, to be honest, it was especially for capromycin and cycloserine. Recently, what is interesting, and especially when all of you probably are no, do know, who have discovered that linezolid is very much needed whenever the new drugs like bedaquiline and delamanid are needed in a, to set up a proper regimen. The major, major news has been for linezolid for the price to decrease by 73% from one year to another and how it happened just by two new generic companies just uh, entering the market and that allowed GDF to get down to 
such a, an, an amazing actually figure. To be honest also, what has helped there to get all these decreases in prices recently is the improvement in forecasting. With get, getting, by getting from countries better estimate of the needs, it allows a um, structure like GDF just to be able to be negotiating on a bigger volume um, than actually for the drug they will need. And also some, something else is also that slowly, even if a lot of countries are criticized for that and still efforts need to be made, they are every day a better matching between the forecast and actually the number of patients that are put on the treatment. And that, for the manufacturers, it's key because it's not only that they're getting a forecast, okay, I will, I will be able to make that amount of money next year, but it's that they're starting really to make that money. Unfortunately for some drugs, there's still a steady price. Clofazimine, well, it's not a surprise. It's a monopoly, just one company producing quality assured uh, clofazimine today. And there are some drugs where the price is increasing despite the bigger volumes. And there, it's mostly because companies have had to um, invest in the uh, production of a, let's say, safer and and improving the quality of the active pharmaceutical ingredient of cannabisin, and especially it happened in two factories in China. So it's good for the patients uh, from a public health point of view, but unfortunately painful for the, uh, for actually the, uh, the budgets of, of countries. Going to the new drugs, pedaculin and delamanid, and I will not go through that busy slides, of course, you, you'll be able to, to get it from uh, the union website afterwards. But just to say today that, well, it's not a surprise, these are new drugs, so they're still a monopoly there with only the innovator producing them. And you will all know that for pedaculin, there's a donation going on till April 2019 for global fund eligible countries. And for actually beside that, there's a tier price policy where the cost of velaculin can go from $3,000 per treatment for the middle income country up to $30,000 for the, um, the richest one. And then for the Lamanid, still for global fund eligible countries, the cost is uh, 1,700, and then target price also in the study, similar in the study that I've mentioned before, the target actually there would be around these figures. So uh, for a monthly treat for a monthly treatment, so there's a gap for improvement, but of course there's also the need for not to lose well a market that will still in be an incentive for companies to still invest. But here, it's the old debate about how R&D could be uh, uh, reshuffled so that we would have adequate treatment with an affordable price, but still uh, being an activity of interest for as many companies as possible. I think there, I would just go ahead to the conclusions. So despite all the, the difficulty actually to, um, to get to more affordable and efficient DRTB treatments. The good news is that even the small DRTB with the small amount of DRTB patients, that can work as a market. And here we see decrease in price that are totally linked to competition. And just going back to the 2001, and sorry it's, I'm to go back in the past, but it's interesting that at that time when a DRTB treatment was costing $15,000 per treatment, at that time, the only initiative that was really, let's say, worthwhile taking to try to decrease the price was Eli Lilly to decide that they will make an effort with capromycin and they down actually decrease the price of their product down to $1, from $4 to $1. But actually, it was a decision from the Lilly, the RTB partnership. You can't imagine all companies moving ahead this way and to have a sustainable market actually still attracting my, more manufacturers to, uh, to produce adequate drugs for, for patients and still investing in discovering the, the new ones that are going to hopefully one day eliminate TB from our little planet. So the RTB market can work as a market with generic competition. Also, whenever that's the case, whenever there is a competition between at least three manufacturers of finished product, also important not to have a monopoly around the production of the active ingredient. Also, whenever the international demand continues to be pulled, that's always a way to really to, to bring price down. And also whenever donors and countries are really making purchases towards quality assured manufacturers only, meaning those manufacturers producing quality assured medicine, meaning that for these people doing the effort to produce adequate quality drugs, the market is really becoming something of interest. There, with the new drugs, unfortunately, we are giving a, a step behind. You saw the prices. L just add the laminate. It will just double up this, this, the treatment with um, 
for the RTB with the WHO current standard regimen. Then for Janssen USAID donation, it will apply till April 2019, and then what will be next? So, and also what we found out is that middle-income countries start to make purely economical comparison between bedaquiline and delamanid based on price and not on medical issues, and is it right for doctors to, to be constrained to do so? And not to forget the necessary companion medicine that are increasing the bill. And just for imipenem today, one day treatment with imipenem costs $14. So if you take imipenem throughout eight months for a standard WHO, the RTB regimen, that's get the bill getting up by $3,000. So the companion drugs, we, are still have, we still have to work with uh, about them, especially for imipenem, for the XDR patients, and definitely clofazimine. And well, thank you very much. And still, of course, we still have to do better. Sorry. Thanks very much. I'm sorry, uh, we've had a little bit of a mishap with the timing, so what we're going to have to do is to move straight to the next presentation. The next presentation is on high ra rates of ocular toxicity in patients who are being treated with, uh, for MDRT. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'll try to make this quick. I know I'm the only thing standing between you and a beer this evening. Okay. Uh, so ambutol is an important component of treatment regimens for both drug-susceptible and drug-resistant tuberculosis. Though it's considered an add-on agent, um, meaning that it's not part of the core TB regimen, ethambutol is attractive because it's thought to protect against the emergence of resistance to other drugs in the regimen, can be administered orally, and has a comparatively low risk of toxicity. In South Africa, ethambutol is recommended as an additional drug in the standardized MDR-TB regimens at a dose of 20 to 25 milligrams per kilogram. One of the primary side effects of ethambutol is loss of visual acuity, um, which results from toxic optic neuropathy due to reduced protein synthesis in mitochondria and its tendency to preferentially affect the optic nerves. Loss of color discrimination ability is thought to be an early sign of visual acuity loss, and there is evidence that visual acuity loss in drug susceptible TB regimens is dose dependent and often reversible. However, there's limited data on vision loss among patients in MDR-TB treatment regimens. In MDR regimens, patients may take ethambutol for up to 24 months, and many of the studies linking ethambutol with vision loss in drug susceptible TB were performed when ethambutol was prescribed at higher doses. Moreover, there's generally little information about ethambutol-related vision loss in high HIV prevalence settings. We conducted this, this study in South Africa, a country that has an MDR-TB incidence of 22.2 per 100,000 population, with over half of the TB cases co-infected with HIV. We recruited patients from three hospitals in KwaZulu-Natal province, one urban, one rural, and one semi-urban. We aim to assess loss of color discrimination using pseudo-isochromatic test plates in a prospective cohort of MDR-TB patients with and without HIV co-infection. We conducted a prospective observational study of adults with culture-confirmed MDR-TB that were initiated on a standardized MDR-TB treatment regimen within 14 days of study enrollment. Uh, we excluded patients that had resistance to fluoroquinolones injecti or injectable TB medications um, and, for, and injectable TB medications uh, or previously treated for MDR-TB. Follow-up visits occurred during the full duration of MDR treatment. Color discrimination testing was performed at up to six visits throughout this follow-up period at baseline two, four, six, 12, and 24-month follow-up visits. Color discrimination testing was performed using pseudo-isochromatic plates using the Hardy, Rand, and Rittler, or HRR test. The, screen, the HRR screening test involves showing patients six cards with colored shapes that range in size and lightness of color and asking the patient to identify the shape on the card. The test screens for both red, green, and blue, yellow color discrimination defects. It takes only several minutes and is simple to score by reporting the number of cards out of six in which the patient correctly identified the shape. Outcomes for our analysis included loss of color discrimination, which we defined as identifying fewer than five of six plates correctly. We defined sustained loss of color discrimination as scoring below five plates on two or more tests, and extended dis color discrimination loss as scoring below five plates on three or more tests. Severe vision loss was defined as scoring below three of six plates on at least one test. We described the prevalence of color discrimination loss in our cohort and performed Cox proportional hazards regression 
with time to color discrimination loss as the outcome, and HIV, age, and time varying a thambutol dose as exposures. Allowing a thambutol dose to vary with time accounts for changes in dose throughout treatment, either due to a change in the prescribed dose of a thambutol or weight gain or loss. Uh, of these 206 patients, 64% were female, and the median age was 33. 75% of patients were smear positive, and 46% 46 had, 46 had cavitary, cavitary disease. 196 were prescribed a thambutol, with a median baseline dose of 19.3 milligrams per kilogram. The median number of vision tests performed per patient was four. And 26% of patients were on TB therapy that included a thambutol prior to their MDR diagnosis and recruitment into the study. 15% of all patients, or 31 patients total, experienced color discrimination loss, equivalent to 158 per 1,000 persons. 18% and 9% among HIV positive and HIV negative, respectively, experienced color discrimination loss. 3% of patients experienced extended loss, and 8% of patients experienced severe loss. The median time to loss was 27 days, and 16 patients had color discrimination loss at baseline. This is a plot with time to days on the x-axis and the proportion of patients with loss on the y-axis, with HIV-positive patients represented by the blue line and HIV-negative patients represented by the red line. HIV-positive patients experience color discrimination loss twice as quickly as HIV-negative patients with an adjusted hazard ratio of 1.9, though this was not statistically significant. Older patients were more likely to ex experience color discrimination loss than younger patients. And patients older than 45 years are represented by the blue line on top and experience the most loss, with loss less likely in younger age groups. Treating a thambutol dose as time variant, there was no relationship between a thambutol dose and color discrimination loss after adjusting for age and HIV status. There are several limitations to this analysis. Uh, first, the minority of patients were receiving a thambutol prior to MDR treatment start, but vision testing did not begin until patients were enrolled in the study. We did not follow patients after they completed treatment and can't know whether vision improved after stopping a thambutol. A thambutol use was derived from treatment logs, and we don't have information on adherence or renal function at the time of this analysis. We use color discrimination loss as a proxy for pre-vision loss, although we do not know the proportion of patients that actually progress to vision loss. We suspect that there may have been some variable in variability in test administration, and it's unknown how this may have affected our results. Lastly, we performed this analysis on a relatively small cohort, which may account for the lack of significant differences between groups. In conclusion, the burden of color discrimination loss in this cohort was relatively high compared to previous studies that have measured, TB, that have measured vision loss in TB patients. We report a risk of color discrimination loss at 158 per 1,000 persons, Generally, color discrimination <coughs> loss occurred early in treatment with a median time to loss of 27 days. Loss was not associated with a thambutol dose. However, there was little variation in dose across patients. Loss was associated with older age and HIV status. Although the association with HIV did not reach statistical significance, this may have been due to small sample size. MDR regimens that include a thambutol even at low doses should raise concerns about possible thambutol-related vision loss. Simple screening tests for identifying early vision loss, like the HRR test, can serve as a useful monitoring tool throughout MDR treatment. However, more research is needed to understand the link between color discrimination loss and risk of permanent vision loss in the setting of MDR treatment, and especially among HIV co-infected patients. And I'd like to acknowledge all of the patients, family members, and healthcare providers that participated in this study, um, and all of our funding and collaborators in the US and South Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and again we apologize for having to rush people through due to uh, timing constraints. Any, we can have one question. Um, I mean I'm surprised at the amount of loss that we've seen in terms of uh, the number of patients and the fact that ethambutol is handed out somewhat like water in certainly the drug sensitive uh, TB treatment. And I think this definitely warrants further investigation. Yeah, thank you. I think, I mean, color discrimination loss is certainly not necessarily a proxy for vision loss, um, but I think it certainly requires some more 
Yeah, so um, I mean the standard of care is, is uh, not necessarily to even do color discrimination testing. Um, and so this was something that was done in the context of this research study. And so there really wasn't any sort of mechanism to, to follow up on these, on these patients um, since uh, standard of care is, is to not administer those, those screening tests throughout treatment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the difficult things is that there's not great DST for ethambutol right now. Um, I'm not sure I can make any recommendations about keeping ethambutol in the regimen, um, but I think the current guidelines in South Africa um, are sort of area specific. So, it, so if ethambutol resistance is high, it certainly shouldn't be prescribed. Um, and these are, um, all of these uh, patients were treated several years ago now, and so I think those guidelines um, the guidelines that don't necessarily recommend adding a Thambutol to the regimen are a little bit more recent. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that definitely more research needs to be done. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're getting the eyeball because I think people are waiting for this room. Thanks you very much for attending and a really rollicking ride through MDR-TB. Thank you. <laughs>